Welcome to Big Dave's slideshow number four. Indiana Dave's adventures to Japan, and then Israel, then a little bit of the country of Jordan. So I keep waiting for all the likes from you guys. So I guess my, my son Jackson, my technical director said, I get enough likes, start to get sponsors, and he says that, you know, he and I can start to make the big dollars. Anyways, here we go. Uh, Japan consists of four big islands and lots of small ones. The one in the north is called Hokkaido, the main island is Honshu, then you have Shikoku, and then you have Kyushu. I keep sneezing, I don't know why. Kyushu. All right, go ahead. So these islands are, are volcanic islands, and lots of small ones, as you see out there in the water. Uh, a lot of the islands are connected together by bridges and by underwater tunnels, even in some cases. So uh, Japan consists of lots of volcanoes. There are volcanic uh, volcanic islands. So this is the most famous one in Japan. It's on Honshu. This is Mount Fuji. Okay. The last time I checked, I think there was 30 to 35 active volcanoes. So lots of earthquakes. Like 2011 was a really good uh, good earthquake. Right, that created a tsunami in Japan. But as one plate slides beneath another, sometimes you get hung up, and when they finally move, you get earthquakes. Now, when that plate does subduct underneath, it can melt and make its way to the surface in the form of magma and then, and then lava and get some volcanoes. Okay, this is on the north. This is the island of Hokkaido, where it's a cold climate. It's that letter D climate on the Köppen climatic system. Really, really but cold winters. Uh, summers aren't too bad though. This is the island of Honshu, which has more of a sea climate, a temperate climate. Uh, this is an area on Honshu I was out hiking around. I was near a Shinto shrine actually when I saw this beautiful waterfall. So lots of small farms in Japan. Um, most of the farms are less than five acres. It's very, very uh, labor intensive agriculture. You don't see a lot of John Deere tractors and things like that. In the hills they terrace. Here they're growing rice where they flatten out the hillsides and they flood irrigate. And it's like everywhere I went there was rice being grown on every square inch available. This is a great slide because it shows an older style Japanese home on the left with the thatched roof and then a newer style Japanese home on the right. Probably belongs to the, uh, to the same family, both of them. So here's more rice being grown, Island of Honshu still. These are like community gardens in the city of Osaka, a big, big city um, in Japan, and people each have their little plots in the neighborhood. Okay, this is a town called Kirishiki. So Japan is a major exporting nation. Japan has, let's see, what would it have? One, two, three, about the third largest economy in the world behind the United States and China. So they, they load a lot of products on the freighters and they bring them across the Pacific to the port of Los Angeles, Long Beach, in many cases, and unload the, all the various products that are produced in Japan. So gas when I was there was by the, uh, by the liter, and I would guess now gas in Japan, because they tax it heavily, would probably be, I'm gonna guess, $7 a gallon, something like that. Okay, if you drive on the opposite side of the street that we do, so if you walked out in that crosswalk and you looked the wrong way, you could die. Same thing when I was in London. A couple close calls. Okay, I believe I'm in Osaka now, downtown. Some major, major traffic in Japanese cities. Japan is uh, like the size of California, territory-wise, but almost three times the uh, population. So lots of good mass transit. It's a little crowded on these subways uh, sometimes, on these systems. Uh, here I am on board. Very, very crowded during, during rush hour. Japanese people work hard. They're all sound asleep right? on the way home here, except the one, one young lady there. Bullet trains. I got to go on some bullet trains. This one was going from Tokyo to Osaka, about 150, 160 miles an hour. Just beautiful. I don't know if we'll ever get it done in California, the full thing. It's so expensive. But if we could, it would be a, it would be a good thing, I, in my opinion at least. These things just rip. It's very smooth, very nice ride. There's your daddy right there, a few years back when I was skinny and I could still dunk a basketball. But these are pickup trucks. You don't see the big Tacomas and things like that, or Nissans in, uh, in Japan. They're all like really small pickup trucks like this. And lots and lots of bicycles. This is kind of a, this is Okayama, I believe the town was called. It, uh, no locks on the bicycles, very, very safe place to be. 
Um, this is the underground. So, like, I think I'm in Osaka here. And so they built the city as high as they could. Then they started building underground, I guess. A lot of subway systems and lots of malls that stretch for miles underneath the city. This is uh, Tokyo. Okay. Um, it was actually a weekday. Everybody was at work. Lunch hour, it just got jammed out here in that, in that area. Another look at Tokyo. Okay, this is Osaka. It looks very westernized, right? It looks like it would be an, an American, uh, American major city. I believe that's Osaka again right there, just the high rises. Now I feel like I'm more in Asia with the arcades. So I believe this was in uh, Okayama. Again, lots of small businesses. Again, arcades, small businesses. Now this is part of the big underground mall that stretches for miles um, underneath uh, Osaka. So you walk and walk and walk and then come up from the underground try to figure out where the heck you are. Okay, this is, uh, that's a friend of mine right there, and he taught at the College of the Sequoia's Math, and I went with him home, so I got to spend two weeks in Japan, and this is like a typical neighborhood in, uh, I think it's Osaka right here, but the streets are really small, so the automobiles are extremely small in many cases. Typical apartments, housing um, in a Japanese city. And I think this is a great slide. It shows a small car, it shows the, uh, the train system, right? and it shows the apartments up above. The Japanese people, basically the living space is nowhere near as it, as it is here. Very typical, those apartments I would guess up there might be 700 square feet, you'd have families living those. Which shoes are mine? Pretty easy to tell. When you go in, in the houses in Japan, it's, it's customary to take your shoes off. They consider it very dirty, dirty if you don't. Uh, this is my buddy's house. It was a really small town. It was called Yoshi Town, and it was up in the mountains, and his father built the house. This is a very typical Japanese house with the sliding doors, uh, the kind of the rattan mats, and they have futons. And we sleep on the futons, then you fold them up um, in the morning and put them away in closets so the living space would be larger. Okay, this is my buddy's mom. You know, a lot of Japanese people are shorter than me. I get bump on my head on the uh, doorway, so she tapes sponges up everywhere. I was getting cuts on my forehead because I'm pretty lame. All right, <laughs> I'm with the family right here, having a typical Japanese uh, meal. What I remember a lot is a lot of sushi, a lot of rice, a lot of uh, they're called seaweed balls. Essentially, they would wrap seaweed around rice, and every meal they seem to have seem to have that. Typical toilet in Japan for males and females. Um, Got to got to squat down there to do <laughs> do those number twos, right? Got to have some strong quads right there. All right, this is the old feudal era um, castle in Osaka. I believe it's a, a replica from the Shogun days. So this would be the castle as it might have looked. Oh, I'm trying to think here, maybe five, six hundred years ago. Surrounded by a moat, of course, for protection. Um, this is the largest wooden structure in Japan. I'm in a place called Nara, it's a big tourist attraction. Inside there's a 700 ton Buddha made out of gold and copper. It's hard to see on this slide, maybe see the outline of Buddha right there. Uh, this would be a Buddhist monastery, uh, dating back to about 1400. It's one of the few that remained intact after, after World War II. Okay, this is called a pagoda, and it's a very common um, feature at Buddhist monasteries. Another pagoda, I went wandering around the countryside right here, I went into this smaller Buddhist monastery. And this guy was supposed to protect the monastery on the outside, but he didn't scare me, I tickled that belly right there and just walked right in. Okay, so Buddhism is big in, um, in Japan. So Buddhism starts in South Asia near the India-Nepal border. Okay, and this is a Shinto shrine. Shinto is another major religion or philosophy in Japan, it's more of a homegrown uh, religion. That's a Shinto shrine. So I visited this high school, I fit right in with that shirt on, huh? Back in the day, we tuck our shirts in and things like that. So I went to a geography class, and they were talking about marine west coast climate. I guess this guy was really nervous that I was in there. But um, it was interesting that this was a high school, the students wore uniforms, um, when, when the teacher called on them, they would stand up to speak. When they were done, they would, they would erase the, uh, the chalkboard there, they would straighten the chairs, empty the waste baskets. That's some good ideas we could probably institute in COS or request to college. 
Cosmos are good at uniforms, but don't ask me to wear a tie like that, though. There's your daddy right there. I don't know what the deal was. I had all these young girls attacking me all the time. I thought I was a rock star or something. They had these little autograph books. They would have me have this sign. It's like, honestly, everywhere I went, you know, I'd act like I'm Joe Hollywood or something like that. When I walked onto the high school campus, this is a true story, all the girls were screaming out the home ec uh, windows at me like I was like, like uh, Rod Stewart or something like that. I don't know, some kind of aging rock star. Yeah, here I am again. My buddy had to come rescue me from all these, all these young, young girls here. They wanted my autograph, and I have no idea why. They had these books that they wanted my signature in. Maybe it's for school or something, I don't know. This is a college classroom right here. And uh, they dress uh, more like you guys do, kind of slovenly, you know, no uniforms, things like that. All right, so uh, I think this was Taekwondo at the high school. Um, dry, golf was big when I was there. This reminds me sort of like what top golf is like today. I'll go ahead. So they, the golf balls pop up and you, and you rip them out there and things like that. Another thing that was in when I was in Japan was pachinko, this gambling game. And every town seemed to have a pachinko parlor. And American culture, McNurse McDonald's. McDonald's was super expensive when I was there. To get a meal that might cost you eight bucks here was like $20 there. And there's Carl's Jr., okay, uh, also in Japan. And the Texas Rangers in, in Japan playing that American country music. This looks like it could be a park, I mean, in Visalia or San Louis, something like that, right? Kids with the bicycles. On Saturdays at this park in Osaka, there'd be 10 bands that would line up in a row playing this headbanger music. And the really loud, loud volume. And the girls would dress up like uh, it was the 1950s do like rockabilly type dance and American graffiti type stuff. And beer vending machines. I was in absolute heaven. Everywhere you went, I don't think you could do this in Visalia because every 14 year old would be out buying beer from the vending machines, but I guess there's more respect for authority possibly. But all I can tell you is I loved it. <laughs> beer vending machines. Okay, we're gonna splice in um, Israel right here. Let's continue on with the video of Dave's adventures to Israel. Israel is the most interesting country I've visited so far in my life, in particular uh, Jerusalem, which we'll get to in a second. So Israel was created in 1948. This is a view from Mount Zion overlooking Jerusalem. Jerusalem has about 800,000 people, sits 2,500 feet in elevation in the Judean hills. So we're going to go into the old city right here, and there are four quarters. So we're going to go in through what's called the Damascus Gate. In the old days, the road out of this gate would take you to Damascus, Syria. I do want you to notice the Israeli soldier up high there, way up there, keeping track of everything. So let's go on into the Muslim quarter. Okay, a lot of energy, a lot of people, a pretty neat place. Um, these roads were not built for automobiles. Um, Jerusalem's built in historical layers that date back a long, long time. This is probably um, an Arab gentleman right here. And the instrument I've been told is called a rababa. And I think he's got a rashada or a kafia on his head right there, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. So the gold dome is called the, uh, the, the Dome of the Rock, and it's on Temple Mount. And this is where King Herod built the second temple of the Jews in 31 BC. The second temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. So the Dome of the Rock, which you still see there, was completed in 691 AD when Jerusalem was under control of the Muslims. And Muslim people believe this is the spot where the Prophet Muhammad rose to heaven and received from God the teachings of, of Islam. Uh, temple Mount is also the spot where uh, the Jews feel Abraham offered to sacrifice his son Isaac. Uh, this is the al Mosque we're looking at right here, uh, originally built in the 8th century AD, which is story rebuilt a few times due to earthquakes. So we're going to go through what's called the Zion Gate right here into the Jewish quarter. The damage you see on the wall there is shrapnel from the 1967 Six Day War. So I'm in the Jewish quarter right now. That street right there is called the Cardo. Uh, it's in the Jewish quarter. It was the main road in and out during the, uh, the Roman period. So now I'm in the, the Jewish quarter. And um, 
my wife was with me, and it was really hot, about 90 degrees, and when you go in there, you have to put a wrap around your shoulders. You can't have bare shoulders. So let's go on in and take a look. Okay, so what you're looking at is the Wailing Wall. This was part of the enclosure wall that King Herod built around the Second Temple. This is probably the most important Jewish shrine in the world. So you're looking at Orthodox Jews, and a lot of the Orthodox Jews, I guess, don't believe there should be a country even called Israel until the Jewish Messiah returns. Now, they don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, obviously. So in their neighborhoods, these guys used these modesty squads to ensure proper dress. And like ladies, if you were to go in there with shorts on, or even guys, I think, with shorts on, or ladies with, um, you know, like a tank top on, something like that, they would, they would verbally harass you, definitely, to get you out of the neighborhoods or to cover up. Okay, so when we were there, my wife was pregnant with our first son, Dylan. And so what people do is they, they put prayer notes into the wall. So my wife put one into the wall, hoping to have a, a healthy baby. And I guess that it's segregated still where men and women, they would pray in different areas. So this is where the, the men are. And I believe they're, I'm not Jewish, but I, I believe they're looking at their, their Torah and they'll kind of bob up and down as they read passages from the, from the Torah. Um, I believe I got that right. Um, I'm going into what's now called the Armenian Quarter for the Orthodox Church. Uh, this area here, for Christians, you probably know more about this than, than I might, um, the Via Dolorosa. I can't think it's called the Way of the Cross. It's the route possibly walked by Jesus as he carried his cross and where he was um, condemned by Pontius Pilate to Calvary where, where many believe he was crucified. The date given on the tour that I went on was 29 AD. So I'm inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre right now. And this is the spot where they believe that the cross might have been where Jesus was crucified. You can't see it really well, but right down here there's a stone, and it was called the stone, or it is called the stone of, of unction. And as the tradition goes, the body of Jesus was, was cleansed and, and uh, prepared for burial on top of this stone right here. So this is the spot inside the Church of the Holy Sepulcher where they believe that, or Christians believe, maybe Jesus died on the cross. This is a Palestinian settlement near Jerusalem. The standard of living for the, the Jewish population is probably ten times higher than that of the Palestinian. So it's very, very third world. This is a Jewish settlement. I wish I'd have gotten closer to give you a shot of this. This is a Jewish settlement outside of Jerusalem in the West Bank area, and they have a very, very high standard of living. This is a city in the north called Haifa, a very nice city. It's, it's on the Mediterranean. It's a port city, a very nice climate. This is the Jezreel Valley, and this is called the Jordan Valley. You can look at the country of Jordan out there in the distance. This is the border with Jordan. So Israel is surrounded by many countries that, that don't like them. You know, let's just be frank about it. So they really have to be careful, protect themselves. So I see jeeps going up and down between the barbed wire electrified fence right there occasionally. So crops that you would see if you went to Israel, crops that I saw, olives. Um, there's graves and you see date palms out there also in the distance. So I went and visited a kibbutz, which is an agricultural communal settlement. It's one of the few times that I've seen where communes actually work. Uh, if you live on a kibbutz, you're called a kibbutznik. <laughs> a kibbutznik. And you have a pretty high standard of living, and it's open for any Israeli citizen to join. Not all Israelis want to join this because not everybody wants to live in a communal lifestyle. These kibbutzes have diversified into industry in many cases also. Okay, so this is the Jordan River. It connects the Sea of Galilee in the north, which is a freshwater lake, to the Dead Sea. Now, on the tour that I was on, um, they were talking about this, maybe the spot or close to the spot where Christians believe John the Baptist baptized Jesus. The date given is about 27 AD. There's my wife right there. Um, she was raised Roman Catholic, so she got some water out of the uh, Jordan River right there and had a priest blessed it and she gave it to some of her some of her Catholic relatives. This is a city called Nazareth and if you're a Christian you probably know uh, this is where Jesus may have grown up. 
Today it's a city of like 70,000 people. Okay. In, in Nazareth, this is the Church of the Annunciation, whereas Christian tradition states, this is where the angel Gabriel appeared to the Virgin Mary, announcing the coming birth of, of a child, Jesus. Okay, this is another historically amazing place. This is Tapka. It's in the lower Galilee region. It's where um, Jesus reportedly performed the miracle of the loaves and the fish. This is, a Caper this is called Capernaum. It's a synagogue where Jesus probably preached. The history is just incredible as you go through this. Um, the Sea of Galilee. This is in the north. It's a freshwater lake, 14 miles by 7 miles wide. It sits about 700 miles below sea level. And a lot of Christian tours here. This is where the tour guide would talk about where Jesus reportedly walked on water. Okay, this is a city called Tiberias. It's on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. It was named a couple thousand years ago after an emperor of Rome. So I think Tiberius was in power around 20 AD, somewhere in that ballpark. I don't know why I took that, that slide, Jackson. Either this is your dad's kind of a dog, I guess, sometimes. Go ahead, next one. All right, so here we go. This is, um, I'm looking at the Golan Heights right here. And the Golan Heights, that's Syria that you're looking at. That's how close all this stuff is together. Golan Heights were next um, by Israel in 1967 because Syrians put artillery pieces up on the hillside and they shot artillery shells down to where I'm at right now taking this photo uh, in the city of Tiberias. Okay, so in Israel, all 18-year-olds, male or female, go in the military, except the ultra-Orthodox Jewish population. Now, there's talk that they may even have to go in at some point here. But as you go in the military, the men go for three years, the women go for two, if it hasn't changed since I was there. And you're issued a firearm, and you're married to it. You take it everywhere you go. So I you sit next to guys like this that have the barrel of the rifle right across my lap, too, on the buses and so forth. So I was lucky. I was in the Middle East at a time of, of relative peace. I was able to go into the West Bank with no problem. The West Bank was, an, was um, occupied, I guess is the right word, by Israel in 1967. So I got to go to uh, Bethlehem, which is a, a really, really interesting, um, interesting place to visit. So um, this is the spot where Christians believe that um, Jesus might have been born, born in a cave. Okay, so this is the Church of the Nativity inside. So what you do, if you want to, right, you line up, I mean, the line was like a mile long, and everybody, you walk down into this cave, because people lived in caves in Jesus' day. And so you walk by here, and you can touch the spot where they think he might have been born. People get very emotional here, Christians do. Uh, there are people down there singing hymns, and they had to forcibly be removed. Lots of tears. It was, it was very, very interesting. Okay, this is the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea sits southeast of Jerusalem, surrounded by the Judean Desert to the west and Jordan, country of Jordan, to the east. Precipitation decreases from 22 inches in Jerusalem to about 2 inches of the Dead Sea. It's like Death Valley out there. The elevation is about 1,300 feet below sea level. The lake itself is 1,300 feet deep. So there's lots of um, Jewish resorts or tourist attractions, too, along the, uh, the Dead Sea. So I went to uh, something called the Injeti Spa. And there's your daddy right there again. You put, you put the mud on. Dead Sea mud supposed to be good for your skin. And then you walk on down and you jump into the, uh, jump into the Dead Sea. Salt content about 34%. You know, to give you an indication, the Mediterranean Sea is about 10%. Another amazing spot right here. So I'm going to go up to uh, Masada on that tram right there. Masada was built by King Herod in the first century BC. So this is where 1,000 zealot Jews committed suicide rather than surrender to the Romans in 70 AD. You've heard the term zealot before. This is where it originates right here. They refused to give in to the Romans. So half of Israel looks like this. This is the Negev Desert. There's another shot of it. Not a bush to be found. Incredible. Now, this is a Bedouin camp. The Bedouins are indigenous residents of the Negev Desert. They make up about 10% of the population of the Middle East. They have uh, traditionally lived in a nomadic uh, lifestyle. 
but more and more they're settling down into fixed locations. Um, a lot of their homes are subsidized by the government. I did see one spot where, uh, I think it was Israeli government built apartments. They threw all their stuff in the apartment and they lived out front of the tents, so the apartment building. So they, they raise goats and sheep, and some have jobs in the formal economy too, and they just do this part time. So camels, they still raise camels. When I was there, camels were worth like two, three thousand bucks. So very, very expensive. There's a good look at this guy right here. They go extended periods uh, without water. Okay, I'm down in the, uh, the Red Sea, the resort area, southern port of, of Elot. And um, it sits right between Africa and Asia. So that's a good look at it. If you look over at that city on the distance there, that would be in the country of um, Jordan, actually. So let's go into Jordan. That's old King Hussein who died in 1999. So now I'm in the city of Aqaba looking back at Elat. And Elat out in the distance there is in Israel. That's how close this stuff is, is together. Okay, so this is the Wadi Rum Desert. I'm in Jordan now. This is where Lawrence of Arabia lived with the Bedouins and fought against the Ottoman Turks. This is a town called Wadi Musa. Um, this is the gateway to Petra. So we're going to go into Petra right now, maybe the, the most um, interesting archaeological site, maybe in the Middle East, definitely the most expensive one to, to visit. So you go through a sandstone canyon to see this amazing, amazing uh, formations in the rock. And so this little gorge right here, so I'm walking through that, and I'm going to come out, and this is what I see. Maybe some of you recognize this. This is from uh, Indiana Jones. I think the first Indiana Jones movie. That's called the Treasury right there. And what the function was is, is unclear. But uh, it's about 130 feet, 30 feet high. Built by the Nabataeans, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Okay, so this area was annexed by the Romans in 106 AD, and you go on a camel ride here, which was just kind of kind of a fun thing. So, um, just go ahead another slide. Amazing um, archaeology as you walk around. The stuff that you see—it's not fenced off. You can walk up there. Just incredible stuff. Okay, that's going to end slideshow number four. Hope you enjoyed all these slideshows, and uh, get your assignment in, Jimmy. Thanks, guys.